You were famously embroiled in one of the most high-profile feuds in British politics. What do you make of what's been unfolding between Alex Salmond and Nicola Sturgeon? Well, you know, I'm Scottish. I'm very proud of Scotland. I want Scotland to stand tall in the world. Uh, but this is uh, not good for Scotland. And I think there's got to be a new code of conduct for standards in public life. If you don't tell the truth, you resign. If you bully or intimidate, you resign. If you're guilty of predatory behaviour, you resign. And one of the problems we've got here, and it's true of the United Kingdom as well, is that when people are accused and the evidence is strong that they've done something wrong, they simply don't resign. We need better standards in public life. And both what's happening in Scotland and what happened to Priti Patel shows that to me. So th that's very interesting. So with with all of the, the legal backdrop to this firmly in mind, of course, um, do you have sympathy with Alex Salmond over the way he alleges that he has been treated? What are your feelings towards both of these characters in this dispute? Well, they're in, in a feud. Uh, they're bringing the country down. It's not really about policy. We're worried about the virus. We're worried about the economic recession. I'm worried about people coming together across the whole of Britain to deal with it. And we've got this feud about who said what, when, and on the basis of some very bad behavior. And so I return to the need for standards in public life. And it used to be the case that if you were accused and there was evidence, you resigned. Now it seems to be the case that if you're accused, you simply say, that you're not going to resign and you're not going to take the punishment that's necessary. We do across the whole of the United Kingdom, and I think you could have a set of standards that each of the parliaments and assemblies were prepared to support. We could have a new code of conduct of standards in public life that everyone accepted that there were no ifs, no buts, no conditional clauses, no get out of jail free cards. You had to abide by that. And the minute you were found uh, that something had gone wrong, you had to resign. So it's, in your mind, there is no doubt that if Nicola Sturgeon is found to have, have broken the, the ministerial code of conduct, then she would simply have to go, in your view? Well, if people haven't told the truth, and that's got to be proven, uh, if people are guilty of bad behaviour, which is proven, as has happened in very recent instances where the Prime Minister chose not to act, and certainly if people are guilty of predatory behaviour towards their staff, as we found has been admitted, uh, then I think uh, you don't have a place uh, to fill in public life. Uh, w if we cannot uphold in public life the highest standards of integrity, and if we cannot trust each other that we will uh, take seriously the vows we make when we go into office, uh, then I think anything goes uh, and, and it becomes anarchy, and I don't think that's the way forward. So do you, do you think it becomes anarchy? That's a really strong word to use. Is what we're seeing in Scotland anarchy? Was, was um, uh, Alex, uh, Alex Salmond even in the correct position to push this argument to the way that he has? Yeah, but we've got a virus at the moment and we should be concentrating on getting everybody vaccinated. The testing system is not working in Scotland well enough. And of course, we've got this latest instance of the Brazilian disease. We've got a million people across the United Kingdom uh, who are looking for jobs as young people only and as big a problem in every part of the United Kingdom. And yet the attention of the political uh, elite seems to be on their own future and protecting themselves. I think we've got to get back to this idea that you're there to serve the public. If, if you don't uh, do the proper things, then you've got to go. Uh, but your sole interest in being in politics has got to be to get things right for the people that you represent. The big question in Scotland, of course, too, ahead of the May elections, is whether it inevitably leads to a second independence referendum. Um, would Nicola Sturgeon's potential resignation be your best hope for derailing that push? I don't think these personalities are, are, are the real issue. You've got to look at it this way. Do you want independence or not? Uh, do you want to break away from the United Kingdom or do you want to cooperate? And I think it comes down to that central question. Now, you could, of course, have a referendum. The question is, should you have a referendum at a time when there's needing a time to heal from the virus and the recession? And we also need a time to reflect. We don't have the facts before us yet. We don't know what independence means for jobs, for trade, for security, for defence, for the welfare state, for our pensions. Nobody has given us these up-to-date facts and nobody has given us the facts about what it means to stay in the union under the Internal Market Bill of Boris Johnson. So let's get the facts on the table. Let everybody see what's actually happening. Uh, and that's the only way in which a democracy can approach uh, looking at these issues. 
So Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, has taken a position on ruling out a second independence referendum if we get to that point. Um, in the end, isn't he going to have to change that position? Because it's only potentially going to be with the SNP that he has a hope of getting into government, isn't it? Shouldn't he have a more nuanced position on a second independence referendum? Well, I think the one thing that's absolutely clear is Keir Starmer's not going to make any alliance or have any coalition with the Scottish uh, National Party. They disagree fundamentally on the future of the United Kingdom and the future of Scotland. I think what Keir's saying is, as I'm saying, you need a time to, to, to heal because we've got to heal from this virus and heal from the recession. But you also need a time to reflect. You need to put uh, all the issues on the table. You need to look at if you like, open the books and look at everything that's actually happening. Nobody quite knows after we've left the European Union and after this virus, what's going to happen to our economy, our jobs, our livelihoods, our okay. welfare state, our pensions. All these issues have got to be considered. If we get to a stage where it is impossible for the Prime Minister to, requ uh, to resist requests for a second independence referendum, would you stand shoulder to shoulder with him in the fight for the union? Look, I've got no doubt that if a referendum was called, uh, the arguments that I want to put forward about cooperation and about solidarity with the rest of the United Kingdom, about empathy and about reciprocity, about how we can actually work together. You know, we, we've been facing uh, uh, the same virus, the same recession. Uh, we've got the same principles governing our healthcare system. I've got no doubt we could win these uh, arguments, but I would like to put forward my own arguments and put forward them in my own way uh, and certainly I don't agree with many of the views of Boris Johnson when he says that devolution is a disaster and we says he won't have a referendum for 40 years. I don't agree with some of his views, but I would put forward my own views. But you, would you stand shoulder to shoulder with him in that fight? I would stand. Fight. Look, I would stand for defending the United Kingdom and Scotland's role in it. But I You're would like a out. different kind of United Kingdom. No, because I'm saying I don't share the same view of the future of the United Kingdom of Boris Johnson. I want to see reform. I want the House of Lords to become a Senate of the nations and regions, or at least we should discuss that. I want a forum of the nations and regions so we look collaboratively, the North, Wales, Northern Ireland, the Midlands, Yorkshire, at all the issues instead of just the centralising government we have. I want the central government to be more inclusive. So if there was a referendum, I would want to put forward my proposals for the future of the United Kingdom. And they may be very different from those of Boris Johnson. And certainly he would disagree with me on what I'm saying at the moment. But why would further devolution, why would a federalisation argument wash with those people in Scotland who want to be independent? You offered more devolution after the last uh, independence referendum and nothing has worked. We're now in the situation where we find that we are in the, facing the potential of the breakup of the United Kingdom. Those who wish for Scottish independence won't care whether English regions get more support. Yes, but I've always argued that we should have a better relationship between Scotland, Wales, the regions and the centre. I've always argued that uh, during the virus, for example, that the centre, Boris Johnson and his team, have not been listening, they haven't been consulting. So that I would like to build better relationships. And, when you, you know, when you ask people in Scotland, they may say at the moment uh, that they would like to vote for independence, but 75% usually say they want cooperation between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. 60% or more sh say they share the same values as uh, people in the rest of the United Kingdom, particularly the North and the Midlands and Yorkshire and Wales. And so there's a lot more in common uh, than some of these uh, polls have been showing at the moment. Do you think the Prime Minister will simply be able to resist the call for a second independence referendum? Or do you think that position will ultimately become untenable? Well, I've been proposing that there should be a review of the future of the United Kingdom. To his great credit, Keir Starmer has set up... That, that's not quite what I asked, Mr Brown. I asked whether Boris Johnson should simply say firmly no, rule it out, so it's simply never on the table for the, for the length of another generation. What I'm, saying, what, I, what I'm saying is you could have another referendum, but you shouldn't have another referendum at the moment. And what I'm so saying when, is Boris when, Johnson... When would you envisage like it then? If, if we get over this virus because, and things become... Uh, more stable and our economy begins to heal, when would you envisage one? Well, you need that time to heal and that will take some time and you need the time to look at the facts and then you've got to make a decision. I don't know what Keir Starmer is going to propose for his manifesto for the next election, but what I do know is there will be an alternative proposal for the future of the United Kingdom on the agenda soon.
and it will be about building better relationships between the regions and nations uh, and the centre of the United Kingdom. It will be about greater inclusivity at the centre so that every voice is heard at the centre. And I believe that that is more likely to command the support of the Scottish people in a referendum than Should, a proposal okay. for either independence or simply an unchanged status quo. Okay, so I see, gonna... I see things changing over the next year. OK, over the next year. So you wouldn't, <clears throat> you wouldn't rule one out before the end of this next parliament, but before the end of this parliament? What I've said is not now, and that's all I'm saying because you've got to have time to reflect, but you've also ha got to have time to heal. When that is over, let's look at what the options that are available are. And I do think, I do think there is a, another option going to be on the table, and I think people are uh, not understanding that the United Kingdom, as a result of what's happened over the virus, the views that are held in Manchester, Liverpool, Newcastle about the future of the United Kingdom, as well as Scotland and Wales, the United Kingdom will have to change. Why do you think Nicola Sturgeon polls so much better than Sir Keir Starmer? What do you admire about her? What I think's happened in Scotland is that uh, you look at uh, Westminster and you see a government controlled effectively by the southeast of England. Uh, you look at uh, Edinburgh and you see Scots sitting in the Scottish Parliament. So it's hardly surprising that people say, well, if Nicola Sturgeon is holding press conferences on the future of uh, the virus, uh, we're going to listen to her. And Boris Johnson, I'm afraid, hasn't given the same impression that he cares enough about what's happening in Scotland. He's got to change. Perhaps Sir Keir Starmer hasn't by that measure then either. I think Keir Starmer is he's a new leader. He's getting his voice uh, heard. He's concentrating on showing where the government has done things uh, wrong. Uh, and I think his voice will increasingly be held. Uh, and I think he is very highly respected and will be highly respected in Scotland in the months to come. OK, let's, let's talk about the budget then. Um, why is Labour going into this week, going into this budget, saying it is opposing all tax rises when even William Hague is arguing for a rise in tax, given the enormous hole in our public finances? Well, let's see what the Chancellor says on Wednesday, but I think he is going to agree with Labour that you can't just in the very month you're putting through this budget, you can't take money away from struggling people and struggling companies. Uh, you've got to have a plan over a period of years. You see, what's actually happened in the last few months is we've got a vaccination plan uh, for everybody in this country. Uh, they will be vaccinated, immunised, but we don't have an economic plan for everybody in this country. And so we don't know what's going to happen to the million young people who have not got jobs. We don't know what's going to happen to the million businesses that are hanging on the edge, sometimes just in life support. We don't know what's going to happen to the million people who are on furlough at the moment, who may not ever get their jobs back. And then there's a million children being pushed into poverty. And this attempt to curtail the universal credit payment of £20 is going to make very hard-pressed families even worse off. So this is the time to come to the aid of these families and these businesses, and then let's have a plan uh, whereby we can build for the future. But, but many people within Labour and without would find that astonishing to hear you say Labour and the Tories in agreement over the economic way forward. Uh, why rule out uh, rises in corporation tax when that tax hits the profits of big companies? I'm not ruling out rises in corporation tax at all. You've misunderstood me. What I'm saying is this is not the time when individuals are struggling to make ends meet and companies are struggling to survive. What you've got to do if you're doing a budget, and I've done 11 of them, those in 10 years, what you've got to do is to set out a plan for the future so that year by year you can see the growth returning to the economy. That's the most important thing. But, but, when the but virus to my is original over, point, isn't it, astonishing, isn't it astonishing for Labour to be in line with the Tories on this when even people like William Hague say there have to be tax rises against the backdrop of an economic hole the like of which we haven't seen since the war? What I think uh, Keir Starmer and uh, Annalise Dodds are saying is yes, you've got to look at the future and about the balance of taxation and spending in the future. But for the moment, in this week and this month and in this uh, few months, you cannot take money from struggling families when they don't have it and you cannot take money from struggling companies that don't have it. I'm not so sure uh, that you're interpreting what the Conservatives are doing correctly. Whatever Rishi Sunak announces tomorrow isn't the fact, and a very depressing fact for the Labour Party, that in an era of huge public spending, in an era of furlough schemes, um, 
support for universal credit, that Labour has very little to say here, that the Tories have stolen the clothes because of the pandemic and there is very little turf now for Labour to park its tanks on. Well, yesterday evening, the Labour Party published a report on youth unemployment saying how a million young people, because I think there is about a million young people around this country, it's an absolute scandal and tragedy, who are doing absolutely nothing at the moment because they're not in work, they're not in training, they're not in education, how they could get back to work. And they were saying that the government's kickstart scheme, which is employing only 2,000 people out of that million who are looking for work, is simply inadequate. And then they think they go on to say that the restart scheme for the long-term unemployed will not start till the summer, when, of course, we've got hundreds of thousands of people who've been unemployed now for more than a year. So the Labour Party is coming forward with their proposals, and I support action. Action, first of all, to help people back into work. Action to stop people losing their jobs as a result of the furlough. Action, too, to help struggling businesses. I, myself, would propose an equity for loan scheme so that businesses burdened down by loans could exchange that for equity uh, so that the public uh, agencies that are involved could get a share of their future profits by investing in them. And I think there's lots of ideas, including uh, Keir Starver's savings bond, that have come forward in the last few weeks from the Labour Party. Um, he's, he's now trailing Boris Johnson in the polls, um, finding it hard to make political traction at the moment in the wake of this extraordinary rollout of the vaccine that we've seen. What advice would you give to him, given that his leadership at this point seems to be wobbling? I, I don't think it is. Uh, I mean, you go through phases, as I found, and as every other leader has, uh, has, has found. It's good that the vaccination plan is working, and it's good that everybody is going to be vaccinated. Uh, and I want that to, to continue to be successful. But I think what Keir Starmer is saying, and I think this will get through very soon, is that you also need an economic plan. I think we also need something for the health service. You know, the reason that we've had so many difficulties in the last few months is that we've had 10 years of underfinancing of the health service. We need a 10-year plan that probably could integrate social care and all the problems it has that needs to be solved into the health care system in a far more effective uh, way. And I think we need a 10-year plan for the health service. Coming out of this virus, we've got to have a better health and social care system. Are you getting ready for a return to frontline politics if, if there, you have to battle for the union? Uh, no, I'm not uh, uh, interested in returning to frontline politics, either in the House of Commons or in the Scottish Parliament or anything like that. I mean, I, I, I think when you've done your time, you've done your time. But, of course, uh, I want to defend uh, Scotland's role. I'm very proud of Scotland. I want Scotland to play a leading role in the United Kingdom in the future, and I will do everything I can to make that uh, uh, happen uh, and, and, and join the debate whenever it is, uh, in, in fact, uh, joined in, in earnest. I think it's important that there are voices of people who stay in Scotland, were brought up in Scotland, uh, whose children are at school in Scotland, uh, who, who, who have lived in Scotland all these years. It's important that we have a voice in this debate and it's not simply left to Boris Johnson. And if Keir Starmer asked you to lead Labour's efforts on that, would you say yes? I don't think it's uh, something that uh, will be decided either by Keir Starmer or Boris Johnson. I think it's really what the Scottish people want. If they want a campaign that uh, defends uh, the Union and Scotland's uh, role in it and a positive proposal for the future of the United Kingdom, I'm very happy to play my part. Gordon Brown, thank you very much indeed.